Hello and welcome to another episode of the Soul Archive, The People's Story. Today we have the honour of welcoming to the show Mr. Ronnie McNear, Alexandra Morris, both who form the modern day Four Tops, and of course Dr. Marlin McNichols, who has had an incredible, incredible long journey in the music industry. So thank you for all of you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for you all joining us today. So my name's Charlotte Hindley and this is Jordan Wilson from the Soul Archive. So first of all, let's just ask you, how, how are you all doing? Are you okay? Good, no complaints. <laughs> cool. <laughs> how's, it, how's everything doing with the pandemic? Well, sometimes I feel like I've been locked up in jail somewhere, man. <laughs> Ten months. <laughs> Got seven more to go probably, but we're hanging. I'm blessed, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of like Ronnie. Kind of feel like <laughs> we've been put on the Isle of Patmos somewhere, <laughs> but in the pro in the meantime, been doing a lot of work on uh, projects that we can work on. So I mean, you know, our families are good. We've been blessed. So there's, I don't have any complaints. I was able to take the time and use it productively, and uh, create a lot of different music and uh, podcasts and things like that. Got to work with Ronnie a little bit while he's on a pandemic and um, some things that he was working on. And then we came together uh, for you guys. So, you know, it, it's been, it's been an adjustment, yeah. but at the same time, it's been productive for me. So I can't complain. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah, that's I'm really to excited to see your projects come through as well. I think it's going to be a really exciting time. For Thank you. you. Oh, yeah. yeah, definitely. I can't wait. But I'm that. not the only one that's got a project coming out, Ronnie Mack. Um, yes, his single is getting ready to drop. We've heard, we've heard about this, Ronnie. We've heard about this. Well, um, last year, about, about a year and a half now, I hooked up with a company called Blue River Records out of Detroit. A uh, guy, this funny story, he approached me and he said, hey man, um, you know what? He said, uh, I'd like to re-identify re you. I said, man, don't you know I'll be 70? <laughs> 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 so, you hear me, Marlon? Yes. I said, I, said, I said, man, what are you talking about? So then the guy said, he said, well, that's the first thing I want you to stop talking about, how old you are. He said, you got your own legacy. He said, I know you went to four chops, and that's great. I don't want to see it, but I think I want to do some things with you. So he had these um, island boys out of the islands start sending me these beats, and I started writing to it, and we came up with something that we think is really good, and um uh, getting ready to come out. Matter of fact, it got released yesterday, but it will be officially released next week called Understanding. It's amazing to know that, you, you know, you've spent your whole life making music, even even, even to an, an older age. And it's just, it's actually really inspiring. And uh, yeah, I think we should get, get to business and start talking about your stories and yeah. let's pres preserve your memories. Yeah, so just a bit of background information on us for the, for the new viewers out there, because I know this is going to have an amazing, amazing response. <laughs> Uh, the Soul Archive, The People's Story, is a series of episodes that we're doing. I work for a record label in the UK called MD Records. And one thing that we are really passionate about is searching for producers, writers of, you know, of music that they, was created in the 60s, the 70s. And then we like to preserve those stories. But the reason for The Soul Archive is basically us to reach out to, to you guys and many other people around the world to get that information and preserve it for the future generations who are getting into soul music. Yeah, it's definitely about connecting the US soul music to the UK audience and yes. soul lovers and enthusiasts. So, and hopefully we're gonna do that today. Yeah. So both you and Ronnie are doing an incredible job of carrying on the legacy of the Four Tops. So just give us a little bit of background information on how you two met and how you came around to being in the four tops. You go ahead, Roddy. <laughs> <laughs> I was recording um, uh, docu a documentary video called Cops. Okay, I, I always, you know, I do, I, I stay, in, stay politically. I, I write a lot of songs like that. And I've got like three or four uh, videos that's out there on YouTube about politics and stuff. But anyway, I was in there doing this song about cops. So <laughs> Lawrence, in the, in the four top, I said, uh, we call it Roki. I said, Roki, I said, you need to go in there and sing that part, man, cause, so we can do this. So Alex was just in the studio. I, I had saw him once before in there, and but I didn't really know him. I met him, but not really, you know, we, we, we didn't get really to know each other. So he was in the studio this day, and um, he 
came and said, hey, man, if you need me, you know, uh, you know, I can put some parts on for you. So uh, we said, OK. So he went in there to do a background part. <laughs> so when I told Roki, I said, go in there and sing your part, man. Roki said, hey, man, I think you should let him do it. I said, what are you talking about, man? I don't might know nothing about, about him, man. I mean, he, yeah, that's good. He put that background on him. <laughs> Who is he? <laughs> so Rook said, nah, man, go, go on, put him in. I kind of got mad. I said, Rook, this is your part. So Rook said, nah, man, because uh, for other reasons. You hear what I'm talking about? <laughs> and I said, oh, OK. And you know, we, we was having problems. We were trying to make, we didn't know whether we was going to get a new singer or not. So he went in there. And he sung it, and after that day, as far as I can tell you about him, is he's great at his worst and magnificent at his best. You know, and I worked with, <laughs> I worked with all of them. I worked with David Ruffin. I worked with with Brass Allen, Levi, uh, Tim Marie, uh, Bobby Womack. Uh, you know, name it. I've worked, I produced with a lot of people, and this guy is one of the top singers I've ever worked with. Well, and that must be so nice for you to hear, Alex, that coming from Yeah, it, it, it was, it was, um, they sent me in to do a note and I did the note <laughs> and I could see him and Roki arguing in the control room. <laughs> so Ronnie, co with Ronnie came in the booth kind of begrudgingly <laughs> and he had the lyrics on, on, a, on three sheets of paper. And so he taped them on the window all right, man, this, this is your part. Do this, you know. Yeah. Go and do so it all. when I started singing, he turned and he looked at Roki and he looked at me and he walked in the booth. He said, what is your name? And I told him, he said, look, man, we're going to keep you on this record. <laughs> Let's be honest, the, the four tops, the dedicated fans, they're a hard nut to crack. And, and I feel yeah. as though you uh really accepted worldwide thank I would you like, i would love i'd love for the for the because I, I mentioned earlier before we started the call that um you know there is a lot of younger listeners um that will be tuning in tonight and mm. i'd love to do some uh background information on the four tops when did the four tops when when did it all start when did it all start you no know, they, they started in 1954 as the four aims that was that was their name and and between that time and 1963, they traveled with Billy Eckstein. They opened for him. They were singing jazz. And um, Lawrence, Lawrence Payton Sr. was the guy in the group that put the, he was very instrumental in putting the background, the sound of the Four Tops together. They have a certain harmony that's different. From, just like, you know, the Beach Boys got a sound, you know, uh, the different Temptations got a sound. Four Tops got some. So Lawrence Senior was the one that did that. But anyway, that's where they started. And a guy named Mickey Stevenson uh, oh. was with uh, <laughs> Obi uh, one night. And they Mickey took Obi to see Smokey Robinson at a place called the 20 Grand in Detroit. Now, this is a story I was told by Obi himself. And he said, uh, Mickey took me in and said, hey, man, this guy make $25,000 on the road. He said, make $50,000, $25,000 a year doing this. And he said, uh, this was back in the early 60s. So Obi said, what? He said, yeah. He said, nah, he's singing rock and roll. He said, do you want to keep singing jazz or you want to sing rock and roll? <laughs> so Obi, Obi said he went back to the group, went back over there and let Mickey dub them in. And here pops up, baby, I need your love. Wow. <laughs> and, they, and they look back since then. So that's how they start. The music for years and years to come, you know the Four Tops will well, be on the radio and it will never get old, ever. Right. You know you got your Gandhis, you got your Martin Luther King, you got your Moses, then came Barry Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you put it in perspective of music, you know, music been he that's right. what he did. It. He was like the music business guru. I mean, it just it just it just happened and he happened to get up on it no matter what in the middle of it and this and that and the other, all the stuff you talk about is one of the greatest uh, companies ever been made in the sound. Like you said, still going today. I, when, we, when we perform overseas, let me tell you something, when we come over there, now we get great responses where we are in the States too. But in, right. the, state, in the States, we play uh, 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 casino theaters, uh, performing arts theaters. Every now and then we stay, play a stadium thing or something else. But in overseas, we, 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 we play uh, <laughs> what is it? What do you call them over there? You talking about the arenas? 
Yeah, there you go. We play when we go overseas. We play arenas. <laughs> See, and I remember when it was my my. I was back uh, in nineteen. When was, was it? Nineteen uh, ninety. No, 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 2000, 2001, I had a chance to become the Ford Chopper, and I had to do like this. You know, I, my career wasn't doing nothing at that time, but so I had to say like that old thing they do. She loves me not. She loved me. I said, uh, Ford Chopper, Ronnie McNair. <laughs> I said, Ronnie McNair, nah. <laughs> Ford Chopper. <laughs> so, I mean, but you, you got to be realistic. So, I mean, God looked out for me, and I was in the position to step in there. And when Levi got sick, you, you made a statement about you know the um, the core supporters of the of the tops being a hard nut to crack. <laughs> That's true. Yes, yes. But I um I never tried to emulate or imitate Levi yeah. because he's the great. He's one of the greatest that have ever done it. Yeah. There'll never be another Levi. And I felt that um, to try to imitate him or emulate him uh, would be a disrespect to him. Mm. Um, I felt that what he would want from me as a singer would be for me to give the best Alex that I could give. And um, so my, my prayer to God was that there's no feeling of Levi Stubbs shoes. That you can't fill his shoes. To try to do that is a is an epic fail. So my prayer was that God would build me a pair of my own that would honor him as the performer that he was, but also the man that he was and the father that he was. You follow what I'm saying from all those aspects. And uh, I have a my my voice and Levi's are similar, and we have big voices, but my thing is that I can only give the best that I have and hope that people feel the, the sincerity and the truth of it, you know, and having someone like Ronnie um, and Lawrence and, and Duke um, to guide me, you know, and, and keep me sharp. One night, I think we were in Fantasy Springs uh, in Palm Springs, and all of a sudden my phone just started going off, bam, 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 like 10 text messages. And when I opened my phone, Ronnie had sung, a, sung 10 different songs that we do and sung them for me to listen to so I would learn how to wow. set myself cadence-wise. And then he talked to me the next day. He said, did you get what I sent you? He said, now, I, I did that so that you can have something to match to. You know, and to me, that, that, was, that, was, that was a big brother move, you know, to make sure that I was becoming comfortable, but that I learned the songs and learned them in the right way. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I'm, I'm thankful to him for that. I'm thankful you, I'm thankful you came. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had to make sure you worked. <laughs> I'm, I'm Marlon as well. You know, we're, we're, just, we're just talking about the four tops now and mm -hmm. that. And that Motown sound from back then, you have had an amazing involvement with the music industry yourself. And where did that all start for you? Well, you know what? It's an honor sitting here with these two guys because I kind of fell into this whole music thing. It was never planned. <clears throat> I never had an idea that I was even going to be in the business because as a youngster growing up in Motown, I was a I was a five, what they call it now, five-star athlete in three or four different sports. And I kind of fell into the music business. And, uh, and from our little town of Battle Creek, Michigan, uh, it was an artist there called Junior Walker. Oh, yeah. And and Junior was, used to play at a little club in Battle Creek called uh, uh, El Grotto Lounge. I was in high school then, and then I started uh, 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 to play saxophone, which didn't last very long. That was a very good idea. <laughs> so, so I ended up selling my saxophone to Junior Walker. My mother them thought I was in uh, rehearsals or whatever, so I ended up selling that saxophone to Junior Walker. And so, oh my God. <laughs> and so I, you know, like I said, I never intended uh, to be in the uh, in the industry. And during that time, two guys came to Battle Creek out the army one named Johnny Briscoe. 
and the other guy was Jackie Beavers. Wow. And then they were stationed in Battle Creek when they was in the Army. And during that same time, Jackie and Johnny had a group called Johnny and Jackie. And out of that group, uh, Johnny and Jackie put a record out, Someday We'll Be Together. Now, that's the I original, remember that. Okay, that's the original <laughs> recording that ended up being the Supreme Someday We'll Be Together. Remember that, Ronnie? That's right. Okay, so it was that Jackie, was, It was Jackie, they called him Jackie and John. Junior had 11 kids himself. Back then, I used to buy Junior pancakes, so we, we became good friends. <laughs> and, one, and one day, I'm sitting on my front porch, and I see this a brown fleet would come down the street and look like it would never end. And, and it passed my house, and I said, uh, who was that? He said, that's Junior Walker. He just got a record deal. I said, oh, that was the record business do? And so, so uh, from there, I, I didn't really jump into the industry right then. Uh, I, 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 I was um, uh, went to college, and, uh, and um, I was a supervisor at the Job Corps, and how uh, from that is from uh, that point, uh, I was a manager of, of a group of kids that were Job Corps kids that had a band, and these kids uh, uh, played every weekend at the clubs. And we had a couple of guys from Battle Creek that had an audition at Motown. And so they needed a band to uh, play for them. So we went down to Motown. After the audition, we're, sta we're sitting on the steps on at Grand Boulevard. And out uh, uh, come this guy. Uh, he asked me, he said, what do these guys do? And I said, well, I said, they're a band. He says, I'm getting ready to open up at, at the Leo's Casino. Uh, for Glass Night in the Pips in two weeks, I need a band, so bring the kids by the house. If I like them, I'll take them. Okay, this guy that came out the door, Edwin Starr. Okay. And so we, so we took the band out to his house, and he liked them. And, of course, the guys, since they were in job court, they couldn't um, uh, go out on tour. But, but uh, from that instant, then I never went back to that job at, 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 uh, <clears throat> at job court. I became Edwin Starr's road manager. And so being Edwin Starr's road manager was my entree into Motown. Right, okay. Now, yeah, yeah. And that's how I got into Motown. Wow. And, and, it, uh, modern, modern, is that when he was with Mr. Wingate? Yeah, absolutely. He was with Mr. Wingate. Go, he's at Golden World. At Golden <laughs> World, absolutely. You're right, yeah. absolutely. Uh, yeah. this, is, this is incredible because you, uh, uh, you're throwing names out there that uh, massive i know people are going to be listening to this like jackie beavers wow do you know what I mean that they he, ha he has absolute a legends on the, yeah. on the northern soul and, scene you know like, and we're just like so excited to hear those names and you you know you just talk about them as if they were friends um so it's absolutely amazing and, and edwin star as well edwin star he is an icon over here because he was in a group, uh, like you say, Golden World, uh, Ed Wingate as well. Um, he was in a group called The Holidays, if I'm, if I'm right, and uh, for Golden World. And he, he obviously went on to record at Motown, but then he became so popular with his, with his records like Time, and he came over here to live in the UK as well. Now, now, now also, Jordan, before he came to, uh, to the UK, we all stayed in California, and Edwin... Uh, and and um, at that time, I was in another business. I owned a, a billboard business out in, in, in L.A. And, 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 um, and Edwin says, uh, I'm moving to the U.K. And uh, if I only get, can get to the U.K., I can work. Because he wasn't working in the United States. And, you know, in the United States, our art is only good as his last hit. So without a hit, it don't work. <laughs> it lets me in four times. Okay, so, 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 so what happened is that Edwin um, uh, sold everything and he moved to the UK in, uh, in I think that was in like 1985, 84, and once he got over here, he never looked back, you know, he reestablished his career. One of my favorite records by uh, The Holidays is uh, a track, I'll Love You Forever. Yeah. I love you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right, I, actually, I actually recently, um, with the, the, the passing of Don Davis, uh, who bought out uh, United Sound, 
um, I, I actually managed to buy the master tape of uh, wow. that track. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. And, it had, and it had uh, some incredible like studio outtake versions of it mm. and uh, the backing tracks when they're just like rehearsing it and acapella versions on there as well, which was just truly mind blowing. Of, of I Love You, of I Love You Forever? Of I Love You Forever, yeah. Well, you yeah. know, you, he and LeBaron Taylor had a company together at that time. All right, okay. solid, hit by, solid hit by our productions. Oh, of course, yeah, yes, yes. And I think, uh, yeah, if, if Don got that, then that was through him and went, Mr. Wingate and, and uh, my man I just said. <laughs> you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned the name Ed Wingate. He was a real character in Detroit, right? <laughs> yeah, but Ms. Ms. Wingate taught me how to be a gentleman. You know, uh, <laughs> I got I got a chance to work with Mr. Wingate. I mean, and it was you know what? He was like another father to me. I mean, really, he he was just a good man. Um, I got to tell you just a little story about when I was when I was touring in, in England. I was at the uh, club called the Astoria Theater. Is that still there in London? I'm not too no, sure yeah, about that. I'm not too sure. Not too sure. Well, there was a theater called the Astoria Theater, and I I worked there. So after that, it was late at night, so we went to this restaurant. Okay, and so. I, I had my uh, uh, guitar player with me and they had tour guide with me and, and uh, the driver. So we were all sitting there at this restaurant. So it was really packed. And this group of people came in. It was a girl that came in and looked just like, it was, looked like she could have been Grace Jones' sister or brother, but whatever it was, had on this Tinkerbell suit. <laughs> you ever seen Tinkerbell? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. With, with this... Stuff coming off of, I swear, man. And so they started to want to dance, her and some other Asian people. And so the, the, the establishment said, come on now, it's too crowded, you can't do that. So us being Americans, I sat there, I know how to, I said, now watch him come over here sit next to us. I shouldn't even say that because I wished it right on me. They came <laughs> and they sat in front of us. And so finally got my food. And when it came to, it, first thing she did was my, my guy was lighting his cigarette. And he could have been gentleman, but he wasn't. So she reached down and grabbed his hand and pulled the light up to it and light her own secret. So, so where is it? So when my food came, I, this is the honest too, man. When my food came, I, st I stuck my fork in my chicken, put it up to my mouth. She grabbed my hand, pulled it to her, took my chicken off my fucking fork oh. and ate it. I said, I, I was so crazy, I just looked at her. Before I could say anything, she grabbed the piece off of my plate. So I climbed up on top of the, the table. <laughs> <laughs> if y'all didn't know, he's crazy. <laughs> wait, no, 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 wait a minute. And I caught back, and, 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 I, and I looked, I said, put your hand in my plate again. <laughs> and so she looked at me and she said, you are Americans. You're American. I said, I don't give a fuck what I am. Put your hand in my plate again. And then so, so my tour guy, so my tour guy kept saying, Run it, run it, come over. So I got up to walk out the place and I said, I'm not paying for nothing. You can't control your people in the place. And so when I got to the door, I saw I, I thought about how ridiculous I acted. So I turned around to the people like I was on stage and I said, ladies and gentlemen, please forgive me. I, I, I didn't want to act like that, but that's a fool over there. And there was this uh, English lady that was sitting by the door. She looked up at me and she said, that's quite all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait a minute. so my point was, I told Mr. Wingate this story. Mr. Wingate said, well, see, son, you get further with honey than you do salt or sugar or salt, whatever you say. He said, if that had been me, you know what I'd have did? I said, what, Mr. Wingate? He said, I'd have said, hey, if you want it that bad, honey, here, you can have it. <laughs> uh, yes. So he taught me. He that's the kind of stuff he taught me. He calmed me down a lot. But like, and I really, I, you know, he was my man. I adored him. Uh. And Jordan, um, I met Mr. Wingate uh, for the first time. I was in the studio, uh, and Norman was over there producing. And Mr. Wingate thought he knew how to produce. And yeah. and, <laughs> and, and <laughs> And and uh, they were playing. They were um, playing uh, a back a track. And Mr. Wingate said, "Norman, turn that bass up. Turn that bass up." And so Norman took his foot and kicked the side of the console. And he said, "Well, Mr. Wingate, is that loud enough?" And he said, "Norman, that sounds great." <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> 
this for us is the closest possible way that we can ever get to understanding what them recording sessions were like. And they just, they, they, they do sound fun, let's say that. Yeah, they, they do sound fun. <laughs> so, Ronnie, I just want to go back to you. Um, so, you recorded your early records in Detroit, but um, where was you born and where, when did your music career start? Like, when did you just knew you were supposed to be in music? I'd love to hear you how you started like well i was born in, in a city the city called camden alabama uh that's right outside selma about 35 miles from selma and um my father and uh was we lived on a farm with my grandfather and my father so he, he brought he brought me to uh pontiac michigan when i was six months old then my brother and sister came about two three years later but anyway oh uh, by the time i got a i saw a picture of my dad holding me on his his lap in front of the piano when I was like about six, seven months old. I get, my grandmother had a piano in, in her house, and upright, and, and I got that picture of me, a little baby, I'm looking back. And I'm, so it was introduced to me, you know, my eyes saw a piano, so it obviously it probably stuck in my head. But when I got about 10 years old, my dad bought my mother. We moved out of this place called the Old Project, and we moved over to a better uh, part of town, and my dad bought my mother a new piano. And um, she played in church and it, six weeks free lessons came with it. So me being the oldest kid, you know, they put me in it. But I thought, I said, I don't want to play no piano. Said, you know, I said, man, I, I, I was a safety patrol. And on Saturdays, you get to go to the show free, get with the girls, you know. So I did my piano lesson was on Thursday and Saturday. Anyway, I did it. And boy, am I so glad and just that they did that for me because they, they, they gave me something that, uh, I never knew that I would have been a piano player like that through my life, and I'm pretty good at it. You know, you don't you're supposed to have confidence in yourself. You know, it's not like bragging, but you know, you, to know that you're good at what you do is what you're supposed to know and believe it. You know, you believe it. So, but anyway, I um start playing the piano. Start and so after the I went about six months. After the six weeks, I went six six months, and I told my uh, dad and mom, I said, I, I don't want to play. What they teach, I don't want to play this lullaby no more. I want to play what I hear on the radio. <laughs> and so, uh, Marlon, that was when Jolton Joe Howard and oh, Ernie yeah, and yeah. Ernie Durham there was on yes, on, on radio. Absolutely. Okay, so you know, I'm I'm like in the fifth grade now, so I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that music though. I'm hearing that yeah. that that money and the Motown thing was just you know, getting ready to do good. I'm I'm listening to Tim Chase's Four Top, so I start playing those songs, learning so, the music. So, uh, Ronnie, your your family had a, a connection to the church. Then is that right? Oh uh, yeah. M well, my mother played played uh, piano in church, and and my m grandmother, her mother, played violin. Her husband, my grandfather, played trumpet in Dixieland band back in the Louis Armstrong days. So he was pretty good, but he, he ended up being an alcoholic. But so he was great at what he did. So uh, that my mother's side of the family is where the the, the um, musical thing came in. But my dad was like the Jacksons' dad. He's the one that pushed me. After I got old enough, where he saw me playing, piano, he would bring his buddies home from the plant when he got out of the factory, and he said, "Son, come in and play Sam Cooke for me. Play Chuck Jackson." I come in there and play. If you ever change your mind, then I go to then I go to any day now. I will hear you say, "I be I be jamming," and he just loved it. And that's probably my best days of all my life because my daddy enjoyed what he helped bring up. I mean, when, you know, that those moments right there, even though he never got to see me be with the four top, he saw me on, on a, a video of it. He died right before he could see me on stage. But to me, those memories of me at home playing the piano with his buddy sitting around, he was grinning, proud of me because I had learned how to do so. You know, that so. that is such a beautiful story, and thank you so much for sharing that with us. I uh, really love that. It's just, honestly, it I'm I'm tearing up here because that is just so beautiful. It is. It's nice just to get a bit of background on you because we we see you. You know, we we watched you in the Four Tops lineup in 2014 when you came over to Manchester, and we've seen you at the Blackpool International Soul Festival, and you are just you know you're up there 
with your crew kind of thing in in the in the lights you know what i mean but we don't know them personal stories behind you so that is just really really lovely lovely to hear and i find it really interesting as well how all you know all of you have a connection to the church as well that, that seems like a big part of your life with you alex as well my father was an older gentleman when i was born my dad was 65 when i was born and which means that my father was born in 1906. Uh, but before my father came to the church, my father was a jazz musician and he played uh, rhythm guitar as well as piano for Gene Calloway, who was Cab Calloway's oldest sister. Right, okay. And then my father played for Cab Calloway and did a couple of stints with Louis Armstrong. And then my father uh, committed and devoted his life to the church. My mother is from a small town called Springfield, Ohio. It was about three hours south of Detroit. Um, my mother and her sisters uh, were very popular in um, the late 50s and early 60s. They were called the January Sisters, um, January being their, their given name. Um, my mom was one of the most phenomenal singers and arrangers um, to do it. Um, she, 12 miles from Springfield, is a small town called Urbana. And in Urbana, one of the greatest jazz singers that the world has ever known, Nancy Wilson, was born and raised in Urbana. But when her mother would go to work, her mother would drop Miss Nancy off and my mother and my aunts took care of her as a child. And my mother became Nancy Wilson's mentor. Whoa. Um, <laughs> that is amazing. When I, and my mother, I think I was probably about four or five, my mother would take me to the piano and my mother would say to me, you sing what I sing. And she would sing a line and I would sing a line behind her. And that's how she began to teach me how to sing. Um, she, she was, um, she was, a, she was a sweetheart, but when it came to music, she was a stickler for things being done the right way. And my mother was, um, a choir director and all that type of stuff. Um, my family on both sides, um, are musically inclined. My younger cousin, um, his name is Johnny Stevens, but the world knows him as John Legend. Oh, wow. That's my second wow. cousin. <laughs> wow. And on my father's side, the DeBarge family are my cousins. Oh, wow. And so all of us grew up singing and in church. I started singing, you know, of course, in the church. And there's a lot of major gospel artists here that we grew up with. You know what I'm saying? And we didn't know that they were actually training us to be professionals but they were hard on us, but not in a dogmatic way, but they were hard on us in presentation and how we sounded and, and in our notes. You know, when I came into the industry, we didn't have Melodyne, Auto-Tune, and all of the different voice enhancers. Um, their voice enhancer will stay in there until you get it right. Alex, what I, yeah. what I tell you, I said, see, when you can say, Three blind mice, and you have a tone in your voice. <laughs> right. That's what's happening. Right. I'm just He's loving. Gotta... I'm just loving how you guys are just. You, you can see it just shines through that you gel together, and and it shows on stage with you as well. You know, sometimes people think that it's a people. People expect, I guess, you to have a certain chemistry. But the thing about us is, our chemistry doesn't start and end when we're on stage. Outside of us as four tops, but just as people, yeah. we genuinely enjoy spending time with each other. We love each other, we love each other's families. We spend time together, um, holidays and in between days. Um, we don't, we, we arguing and all that stuff, we don't have that. So yeah. what people see on stage is actually indicative of the relationships that we have off stage because we're all very, very close. What I, what I love so much about what you're saying is 
because the reason the four tops stayed together for so long with Levi's commitment to the group. Right. And, and still today you are holding them values. I can see it with you, with you both. It's, it's incredible. It's really nice just to hear you both talk so positively of each other. Um, but you know what though, man, you got, you have to have, see, like, see, he's being modest, but <laughs> 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 you have to have in a group like that, like I said, you can't take Levi's place, but the magic with that and like groups like the Temptations, you have to have a powerful voice. Mm -hmm. See, and he's got that. See, that, it, it ain't easy. See, all them keys that Levi sang in are way up there, and and and, and a guy like that, he stepped in the keys. Didn't, we didn't have to change any of the keys. He stepped in. <laughs> we feel like you can't go up. But it's higher than that. But when you can do that and keep that power going on, then you, then you there. You you can carry the four tops on because it's like it's already a machine that's already rolling. All you got to do when you lose a spoke, you re you put this other spoke in there. That's and that's what's been happening with us. And it's been just a pleasure for me to stay. When I come over there anywhere, man, I come and stand on the stage and see thousands of people clapping for me because I'm singing some songs that was done 60 years ago or however long it was. Man, that's just it's just so amazing. You know, yeah, man, I, I I never get over that. I'm so thankful that that I was able, I'm able to be. Four times. I'm just thankful that I'm able to be standing in front you know of the crowd that like what we do. You know. You know what, Jordan? People think that Levi, that he helped, that he he sung these songs in a lower register and a lower key, because Levi has he had what we call a, a heavy tone. Yes. So it sounded <laughs> like he was singing in lower keys. I thought he was singing in lower keys until I opened up my pie hole and tried to hit those notes. <laughs> right. And the man singing in the rafter, Ronnie looked at me one day and said, you better go up there and get the note. He's going up there and get it. <laughs> uh, go get it. Go get it. <laughs> but Levi, Levi and Jackie Wilson are cousins. Right. So that let me, know, that let me see, see the range right there. That's amazing. Well, I wasn't a cousin, and you still made me go up there and get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, they weren't going to change the keys to the songs, man, so you had to get right. it. I know. <laughs> I want to ask you, Ronnie, about your records, um, because I've had so many questions. I put this out there on our radio show. I said, look, we're doing an interview with Ronnie McNair. And I said, if you've got any questions, send them in to us, and we'll try and answer them. And some of the questions that are coming in, Ronnie, are all about your record um, <laughs> on detail. Everybody okay. is so curious of that record and the background on it. So it's been so popular on the Northern Soul scene in England. Um, what, you know, give us some background information on that. How did you become, so we touched on about you, you know, where you was born, you move into Detroit. So how did you then grow into them go, well, going into a recording studio and cutting that record um well like i said after i got about you know when i started playing piano at, at, at 10 11 i started learning to play and then as the years went by i got better but dad stopped putting me in talent contests and uh, i remember when i got 16 i was in the wchb radio talent contest in detroit they would have um 18 contestants and in the middle of us the show they would have motown acts in between us I won second place. Uh, there was a girl, you probably know her name, girl named Frances Nero. Oh, yes, yes. She, she beat me by one point. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so afterwards, my dad, you know, we're, we're from Alabama, man. We don't know nothing about the music business. So the man said, she didn't beat you, man. She only beat you with a, by a, because of a tire. And, you know, I, so I looked at my dad, me and my dad looked at each other and said, a tire? So I looked at my dad, I said, man, what? What are you talking about? What kind of tire? I'm thinking you're talking about a wheel, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was talking about dress, you know, a tire. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. I didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know shit. Man. So, but the but I, but you know, she won five hundred dollars in the contract with Motown. I won two fifty, but I was a ninth grade man. Shit, I was rich. Two fifty. So I went and so after that, then I wrote this song. There was a girl sitting in my data processing class, in my study hall, and my data processing class. She was a white girl, okay? Now, when I was a little boy coming up, you know, when I would go to Alabama every year on the farm, I got to plan with one of my, uh, the lady that owned the store, she had a little uh, 
niece and nephew, and they were white little white kids. And so my grandmother told me, don't you whistle or work your eyes. That no white girl, they'll tie a fan around your neck and throw you in the river. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Charlie, but I was through with y'all ass then. <laughs> yeah. I after that, white girl was just, I don't even see him. When I saw one, and then I turned and looked the other way. I stayed with black, Puerto Rican, Mexican, whatever, you know. So <laughs> until I got until I got 17 years old. I'm in this, and I looked over across the across the <laughs> the aisle at this girl, and I said, Oh, she's so pretty. I said, but she ain't going to like me because I'm black, I'm colored. And so my buddies, when I told them, they said, oh, man, she ain't going to care, man, because she's going to think you're Mexican. <laughs> anyway, so I said something to her, and she said something back. And I wrote this song, sitting in my class, watching the girl in the next row. And that's who it was about. I just want to interrupt you now. I just, I just want to know more about the girl. Like, does she know that? Like, do you know where she is? Have you ever been in contact with her? Does she know you wrote a record about her? Don't get yeah. shot, Ronnie. Yeah, she knew. <laughs> she wrote. Yeah, she knew that I wrote the record. We that was I was that was that was eleventh grade, and that was uh, nineteen sixty-seven. That's when I recorded the song at Dito. So she knew, and uh, we went and in high school. We had a little affair. We did have an affair. I used to be scared too, boy. But I, <laughs> I had it, and uh, she knew about the record. But as you know, time went on. We all graduated. We all went out our ways. You know how the racial thing here in America is a little different. Yeah. So yeah. Wow, we are. Uh, that is that's amazing. Can you remember what studio you cut that in? I cut it at Tara Sherma on Livernois in oh. in Detroit. You know what that is, Marlon. No, oh, that yeah, was oh, yeah, Russ Tarana. Russ Tarana yeah, was, yeah. the, was the main guy there. Yeah. I cut it over there with the Funk Brothers. And it was at that time, it was, you know, the Funk Brothers had like, uh, it was like a, any any sports team. You had the first string, second string, third. You had the first, second, third crew of, of guys, you know. Mm. And this crew, I had Bob Babbitt was on the bass. I was sitting in my crib. Bob Babbitt played the bass. Uh, um, uh, Pistol played the drum. And uh, Johnny Griffith was on piano. A guy named Floyd Jones did the horn arrangement. Bobby Hall played the Congress. He was the second other than Eddie Bongo Brown. And um, George McGregor played drums. No, George McGregor played drums, not Pistol. Yeah, right. George <laughs> McGregor. Wow. George McGregor. Wow, George McGregor. I I've been reading <laughs> about that man because he was married uh, to Barbara Mercer as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, but, but yeah. these are the guys. I was only seventeen, and I got to really get the experience of being in the studio and seeing how it go. And and even uh, after then, I I went to uh, no before then. My when I was sixteen, when I when I won second place at uh, the CHB contest, I signed up with Don Davis and the Baron Taylors Solid Hit Brown Production, and I would go over to United uh, Sound when Bob Dennis and guys like that were over there the, back in the day with just four track studio over there. But it was, well, I got I, to see James Jameson, Mike Terry and all the guys. I brought these along today, actually. Um, the original United Sound uh, Masters. Uh, can you see that on the camera? Yeah. That's yeah. Their, yeah. That's their logo. When, I, when I said to you at the start of this call, I was a total obsessive of uh, Detroit soul music and soul music. I, I seriously am. I've dedicated all my life and my money into uh, into getting all these artifacts and things. You like have that. to come visit sometime, the oh, two of you. That, that would, we would that love that. So we can show you around Detroit. I would really love that. It's both of our dreams, isn't it? it yeah, we've it really is. Um, just, so we, just before we move on, I just wanted to talk about sitting in my class record again um, okay. and just talk about the school bell and the cheering at the beginning of the track, like, was that at your school? Was that your classmates who did that? No, the, they, I don't know where that was. Now, I'm like you, I, would, I always hit a little boy in there saying, you ought to see, <laughs> and I would say, I wonder what he was gonna say after that. He was like, you ought to see what I, but I, I, you hear the little boy say that when the bell rings, bing, yeah. then you hear the crowd and he said, you ought to see, bam. Da, 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 da. So I don't know what school they got that at, but uh, I know this, that if they had a deal what they're supposed to do, it would have been a hit record. But it ended up that way, you know, for years, um, when I like it's, when I was telling you the story about performing 20 years later, and the people would tell me to play the song. So when, when I got through singing that song that day, at that night, and I came off the stage, a guy walked up to me and said, sign my record. Now, you know, that blew my mind, because I hadn't seen the record for 20 years. I had my own copy. And so I said, my my 
my record. And he, <laughs> then he gave me a copy of sitting in my class, but it wasn't the original. I could wow. tell the color was a little different. Yes, Modern, yes. so you know that was my yeah. first. That was my first introduction to bootlegging. Yeah, right, absolutely. So, so I know, Ronnie. Yeah. So, so I asked the guy. I said, I, I said, man, what you? How much you pay for it? He said, I paid forty quid. I said, what's that? He said, forty pounds. I said, for this one record. And he said, yeah. And through the years, the last that I know, the record went up to about two thousand dollars on eBay for a, a original copy. Through the years. Since, since then, and that was like 19, 20 years, that was 1987 that I was over there. From from then to this day, I've been going back and forth, coming over to the UK, doing, singing their songs and singing other songs that I've done. And for years, I, I had this thing, on, you know, this weight on my shoulder about the bootlegger. Who did this to me? Who did? Finally, I came to myself one day and I said, you know what? You might as well forget about that because six and one half half dozen another. I said, if it don't be that they bootlegged me, I wouldn't be over here singing and entertaining these crowds and they come nice. short. So I let that I got rid of that and I and I love coming over there and whoever and, and I did find out who did it, but I won't even say talk about that. Yeah, no I thank them for doing it. <laughs> and I thank all the UK crowd, the Northern Soul people for supporting me all these years because it's, it's been amazing. Like I keep saying, we, we've grew up listening to them tracks and it's it's lovely just to get an insight, at, you know, behind the recording. And Well, you know, now you got the new new one that's getting ready to be a, 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 a classic with Alex's version of Isn't She a Pretty Girl? <laughs> it is amazing it's a great version of the record you guys really like it we I love, love it, it. Yeah, yeah yeah do you know what's good about it though is is that it's it's close to the original but it, it brings it up to speed up to that you know that it, it it can appeal to a new audience again as well so it's it's incredible you've done a really really good job of that Thank and you. i, I, I well, have... got a signature singer on there now <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, man. <laughs> I was out of, when I sang it. I was out of tune. I was a kid, but it did good. You know, it was. You know, yeah. you have to learn. You you be out of tune when you first start. Sometimes then you learn. You have to. I had a friend that told me that the the um the formula for success, and he and this and it ended up right. He said, uh, first you gotta have intelligent direction about anything you're trying to do. Then when you get that, you have to perform skillful execution which I've done that in my life. And then I, I said, you know what? You got to add something else. I said, you got to stay ready. Because one time I was sitting in my living room on, in Pontiac, nothing was going on. And this was in this, this was 1984, 85. I'm sitting there, man, and I, but I was still practicing. Now, I never stopped, no matter what steer me. I get in the street, I may be out there. I mean, be whatever, you know what I'm saying? But I always come back to the piano and do my thing. And this particular day, Tina Marie, are you familiar with Tina Marie? Soul singer from the States? Do you know what? No, I don't know. I'm not too it's sure. It's amazing. See, you, you're a younger artist. It's amazing you're here because she was a big star from Motown. She okay. ended up singing with Rick James. But she called me up one day and said, Ronnie, can you come to L.A.? I need you to dub in. I said, I could have came yesterday, baby. <laughs> so she sent me a ticket. I went out there. The song was in a high key, but because I was ready, I was stayed ready. Mm-hmm. And I did the song with her, and it came out. So, so, that so you got had that big afro? No, no, no. I didn't have the afro then. That was, that was the RCA album. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that was in summertime. Because <laughs> I, I, I know I saw you and Tina Marie singing on, on Soul Train. No, I didn't have an afro then, but my hair was long, though. <laughs> yeah. Marlon, yes, just going over to, to you now, and uh, just to pick your brain of some of your memories, because I, I, I just, when we've been talking through Facebook and we, we had a, when we had our first call together, it was amazing some of the connections that, that you made. So earlier on in the call, you mentioned how, you know, you formed a relationship with Junior Walker. And what went on? After that, for you, then what, what? How did your career progress? Uh, like I said, I was uh, from Battle Creek, Michigan, and I moved down to Detroit, and I uh, started working with Edwin. Edwin. And, and Edwin, uh, as I said before, he was my entree into the real business of the record business or the real entertainment business. Because when I was a kid, my dad used to put on 
uh, little concerts and stuff. And I used to run around and help him put the fly cards up on the telephone poles. So that was just, you know, I had to do it because he needed help. But when I moved to Detroit, I got in the, uh, in, in the, in the industry as um, Edward Starr's uh, a road manager. And, and from that relationship through Edward, I got, I met, you know, Norman Whitfield and, and Holland Doge in Holland. And, and uh, then I uh, became friends with, with what she's still one of my best friends now, Paul Reiser, uh, the Ranger, and, uh, and also uh, 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 Barrett Strong and some of the other guys. See, I, I was more than like never on Motown's payroll, but I was always connected to them. So everybody connected me to them because of my relationship with like Obi Benson of the Four Tops, who I met running through Obi, and Obi was my best friend th at that time. And I <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I got, I was uh, like the a guy, after I really learned the business of the record business, I was the guy that like Obi, not his attorney, but I would handle a lot of Obi's business on the side, or give them guidance, and also that same kind of relationship uh, spread over to uh, Eddie Kendricks and and uh, you know David Ruffin, and so I so I got to know them outside of the Motown uh, 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 everyday uh, 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 business, and uh, that's also uh, uh, what happened is that when Motown uh, moved to Detroit, uh, excuse me, moved to L.A. I think that's around seventy one or seventy two. Uh, if I'm right, Ronnie, uh, when they left, when everybody left for L.A. Uh, oh yeah, said, okay, Ronnie, yeah, right, somewhere around in this, right after '69, '70, yeah, '70, right. '71. You're right. Right then, when all of the guys, uh, all of uh, the Funk Brothers, all of them moved to L.A., but they just didn't. It did that magic in L.A. It didn't happen for them like it did in Detroit. And oh so, man. Yeah, and so when they moved back to Detroit at that time, I was. Uh, in Atlantic, uh, Atlanta, and, and, and so I used to fly all of them down to do my sessions in Atlanta. So I kept them working and uh, uh, when, they, when it wasn't no more Motown. And so I always stayed uh, connected with them. Uh, but then uh, after I moved on from, um, from, from Edward Starr, I, uh, I, I went to Atlantic Records. And at Atlantic Records, uh, I, I ended up being a vice president, and I was one of the uh, early days of uh, Led Zeppelin and the Bee Gees, uh, 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 um, uh, other, uh, when they had the English explosion, I was at Atlantic Records, and I was one of the guys up front that were responsible for Led Zeppelin, the Bee Gees, and, and those other groups uh, getting their records played on the radio. So a lot of these plaques, that you see in the background, uh, they're the Bee Gees, Led Zeppelin, the Rolling Stones, and those other kind of groups. And so uh, uh, that's what I, you know, did at Atlantic Records, and and um, also uh, there's a little label in Atlanta called GRC uh, Records. And when that GRC, label, you remember that, Ronnie? Yeah, with GRC. I think it, 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 it that was Bunky Shepherd where I had that record. Just can't let you go. Yeah, yeah, right. And, and then Lolita Holloway. Uh, was really? on that label. And, and then, Joe, uh, wasn't Joe, uh, that was Bunk and Joe, uh, what was it, Joe Isgro? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then okay. also, and then also, uh, during that time, um, uh, uh, I wrote a song for an artist uh, that we, that was a taxi cab driver in Chicago by the name of John Edwards. And then John that Edwards, <laughs> then I wrote a song called uh, Exercise My Love, and then John Edwards, uh, when Philip A. Uh, was threatening to leave the uh, Temptations, uh, John Edwards was flying to Detroit to rehearse with them on the weekends, and I put John Edwards with the Spinners. So that's right. how John Edwards got with the Spinners. Spinners, and um, and so uh, uh, then I, uh, you know, uh, uh, had my own record labels and and and. and, and um, and I was always a, a part of the business side of the of the record business that uh, Warner Brothers, Electra Records, and and um, and um, you know I was you know very you know blessed to be able to uh, 
just like Ronnie, uh, meeting Ronnie through, uh, through, uh, through Obi. And like I told Ronnie earlier, today, uh, I looked in my closet and I pulled yeah. out, this, uh, out this leather jacket, this green jacket I got on right now. This yeah. belonged to Obi Bits another four times. Wow. Yeah, wow. right. And so I put this on. You ain't got, only thing you don't have is the hat. <laughs> right. That's all that I don't have is the hat. You're right. You're right. You're right. And so, uh, so you know, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, my involvement in the industry, it, 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 it's, it's go all the way from a &R to producing, to management, to record label owner. To, so I've been involved in, in mostly in every facet over the last, uh, you know, 50 years. And still are to this day. It, it, you know, and we're still putting out records. It, and I got a, I got a fond, a uh, lot of uh, 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 love for the UK uh, because, I, you know, I work instead with, with folks over there like uh, DJ Judge Jules, and which is one of the biggest DJs uh, ever, and also... He started from the UK, and and I got a lot of strong relationship over there at radio, and and uh, and so uh, uh, we're still putting out records, and and um, you know that's kind of sums it up where I've been, you know, over the last fifty years and, and years. I love it. I, you know, I absolutely loved us this, what's coming through, because it just shows how still to this day you are so alive with the music industry and still doing things. It's, it's great. It's really warming just to chat to you and hear that. Ronnie, you, uh, there's, there's just things that Marlon's just brought up then about uh, like names like David Ruffin. A, a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Richard Serlin, who's so well respected in England, and he, he speaks so warmly of you. And uh, of course, he tells me that you, was, you had really close relationships with uh, John Anderson in England, who's considered a pioneer of you know, promoting soul music in England and selling soul music. Um, he, he's telling me about an incredible track that you recorded with David Ruffin and it was called uh, We Need Peace. He was telling me about when you was over, over here in England with John and you give Richard a cassette of that uh, unreleased track. Do you recall that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, me and one of, one of my uh, good friends, uh, writers that I write with, a guy named Michael Crump, <clears throat> he came to me with those lyrics. And he really, he just came, he had the lyric and the uh, chorus. He came to me and he said, hey, Mac, what do you think about this? And he said, we need peace today. I said, oh, that's pretty. I said, well, let's see. So we did the track up. And then next thing you know, um, I got a chance to deal with David Ruffin. Matter of fact, David was just getting out of prison for some tax deal he had. And I told Obi, Marlon, I said, I said, Obi, tell, if you go get David, see if David is saying this stuff with me. I had met David before, but we, we weren't really uh, good friends or anything, but we were acquaintances. And I said, see if David will sing this stuff. David came to my house and dubbed in on a four track machine for me, man, right at my house. He, <laughs> he, he sang that and a few more songs we had, and it led to a, a deal with Hall and Oates uh, later on. Yeah. In mm -hmm. yeah, Gabe Vigorito came to it. Gabe Vigorito, you, have to, you know Gabe Vigorito, don't you, Marlon? Yes, yeah, sure I do, absolutely. Doing the game, man. Yeah. So, yeah. so he was he he came he was the uh it was a kind of production deal. It started out with CBS, then we had some problems and it ended up with RCA at the time. But I did a, mm -hmm. a album. I did two songs in that album on David and Eddie. But that's uh how that happened with David. When he came out, he sang the song and he took it and played the tape to Hall and Oates and they liked it and we got a deal with it. What was David Ruffin like? Just just tell tell us about him as a person. I'm sure, obviously... I'm sure everyone can jump in on this as yeah, well, definitely. Marlon. To, to me, for me, he ended up being one of the best friends I ever had. You know, and that's that's uh, aside from you know you hear a lot of stories about David, but for me as a person, he was one of the. I mean, just he was for real. He was a real person. You know, he everybody got the crazy ways. You know, you know, but but as a person, man, he was just down, and he was. Oh, we, I'm gonna tell you what. When I got a deal, when we got the deal with Hall and Oates, they wanted to give uh, the other producers. They didn't want to give me the money to produce like they were giving the other producers. Mm. And David said, mm. "Told him, he said, if you don't give him, they wanted to let somebody else produce it." And David said, "If you don't let him produce his song, I'm not doing it." And I said, "Wait a minute, David." I said, "Hold on, man." I said, "You know." 
I wrote it, so I'm gonna get some get something there too. I said, you know, it don't it ain't, let's don't kill the deal or nothing. He said, nah, man. They want to you, you. They liked it the way you brought it to them. Now they want to take it and take your idea and let somebody else get the credit for it. He said, I'm not. And when he did that for me, that was me and him from then on. That's incredible. And how about you, Marlon? I'm sure that you must have some memories of David Ruffin. David was a, was a great guy. I mean, you hear him. Uh, this, I'll echo what Ronnie said. You hear a lot of stories, and and uh, you know he he had his own uh, ego. He had you know, and, and but uh, if, if David liked you, like him and Eddie was like the best of friends and instant friends. And if David li uh, was uh, liked you, well, he liked you, and and, and you don't have no problem with with him, especially if you understood him, and and, uh, and uh, so. Uh, to me, he was one of the, uh, uh, the greatest friends I had at Motown. And uh, as well, do you know I mean I, I know that you, Marlon, have have worked with lots of names up there, just like David Ruffin. And um, I, I was speaking to our, our man Chris, and he said to to ask you about Stevie Wonder as well and uh, Marvin Gaye. I remember when when, when Stevie first uh, came to Motown, and and we first came to Motown. Uh, uh, Martha Reeves was his babysitter. Martha Reeves used to take Stevie around because at that time Martha was just the secretary. She wasn't Martha Reeves the artist. And so, and so Stevie um, uh, uh, and his mother, and I believe they uh, they were from Saginaw. And um, and also when Stevie first got uh, down there, he became great friends of, of another uh, Motown drummer, uh, Bohanna. And uh, Bohanna Hannah was, uh, uh, they used to call it Bohanna the Motown sound. His band used to be the band to go out on the road. And so mm -hmm. Stevie, Stevie and uh, uh, Bohanna was great friend, friends. And out, out of that relationship, uh, Stevie and I became, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty close. And, um, and uh, a lot of the early days, uh, Stevie used to come in the studio with songs and have ideas. And and, with, and and Hank Cosby and the other uh, uh, experienced writers used to uh, take those ideas and make them the records. But I heard a, heard a lot of those songs before Stevie even brought them to the studio. And what about you, Ronnie? What about your memory? You say you you were close with uh, Marvin and Stevie. Oh well, I didn't. I was really close to Steve. I was close to Clarence Paul, who okay. was Stevie's producer. Yeah, absolutely. But, Clarence, uh, him, he and Obi and all them guys was tight. You know, they was all cool with each other. So, and I was a generation under that, but they would introduce me to all the rest of the guys. And so, um, uh, Clarence would. I remember uh, Clarence took me to Stevie Wonder Studio in the '80s up on in LA up on was it on Western Marlin? Yeah, studio no, up on Western. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, so Stevie had a song back in the '70s that Clarence gave me the tape, and Stevie only had. The hook and no no words, but it's the melody. And I said, man, that's bad. I said, well, what are you doing with that? Clarence said, he probably forgot he'd done it. I said, like a lot of stuff I do. So I finished the song over the years. So Steve, uh, Clarence took me to Stevie's studio. And he had two baby grand sitting right next to each other. And I called Stevie Wonderful One. I said, hey, Wonderful One. I said, uh, I got something I want you to hear. And he said, better be good. He was shaking his head like that. He said, better be good. <laughs> I said, well, it's yours. <laughs> I said, so I started playing it. And man, he jumped on the piano and me and me and him played for 20 minutes straight. Just jamming. That's one of my that's one of my career memories of all, man. I, we just sat there jamming like that. And the CP said, you know, he don't do that with everybody, man. He he was enjoying himself. I said, me too. And Marvin, same type, Marvin they was gonna record a song that me and Obi wrote. And then Marvin passed away before he could do it. But I went to, uh, Clarence took me to uh, Marvin's studio up in Hollywood. And Marvin got on the drums and I was on the piano and he and I jammed. And that was just, man, I love that. Cause that was my hero there. Yeah. I'm absolutely loving this. It's great. It's yeah. just great just to hear everyone's memories. And you know, I got one other thing I want to tell you that David told me one time, this is about David. David, I, I, after I did a song with David, I, look, I told David, I said, you know what, man? I said, if I don't make one dime on this song you sung, that you sang my song, I said, if I don't make nothing, I'm just so glad that David Ruffin thought enough of my song to sing it. I said, the guy, I said, the guy that sung my girl, 
thought enough to sing my song, man. That's all I, I I'm so glad. And he looked at me and he said, shut up. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he, said, I, he said, I sung this song because I respect your talent and don't you forget that. And when he showed me that kind of love, that you know, let me know where he really was with me. He, he was a great guy. All three of you have been so involved in music all of your lives. And then today, in one way or another, you are all come together as this one pact now still keeping this legacy of the four tops going. And it's incredible. You are still performing and alive. Okay, and just, you, you're you full, know, it's, full of, um, you're full of energy. I don't know what <laughs> else to do. And, uh, yeah, you if, do. You play if, golf all the time. That's what you do. Well, okay, but... I'm saying I don't know nothing else to do, and like if it wasn't and if it wasn't for no music that happened, uh, y'all got money over there in the studio. I, I'd be over there and stick you up. <laughs> it's it, I, it's I, I I'm kind of like you guys. I'm a fan of the of, of the two of them, but I it's the I the way Ronnie just spoke about David. It's kind of how I feel. When, especially like when we just did the song, um, Isn't She a Pretty Girl? Um, you know, uh, Chris Dixon and Doc um, McNichols and, um, you know, they're putting together the, and, you know, their company, MC Films, you know, they're putting together a documentary and so forth will be done on the tops. And I get a call from Doc and he says, Chris asked him if it was possible that I could do a Northern soul type song. Well, Doc threw me under the bus and said, yeah, he can do anything. I said, wow, thanks Doc, you know, thanks for the pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and he sent me um, some songs and several of the songs he sent me actually were Ronnie's. And so we were listening and I was with, uh, some guys that, that we work together with um, musically uh, as producers. And we were listening to the different Northern soul textures and sounds. And then it dawned on me and I said, why imitate it yeah. when I can go get the genuine article? Mm. And so I picked up the phone and I called Ronnie. I said, hey, listen, man, I said, um, I said, I need to do a Northern Soul song. I said, I, I said, I need you to, to produce it, write and produce it for me. And he said, we'll write it together. I said, no. I said, I need you to write and produce it. He said, better. He said, you know what? He said, better yet, he said, I got a song. And it was, isn't she a pretty girl? And he sent it to me and I listened to it. And to be able to, um, I think uh, to me one of the greatest honors was a song that Ronnie is known for and did at 17, being the original writer and singer of the song, for him to take out of his time and then come into a studio and produce someone else, that being me, to produce me singing his song, um, I think to me, that's like one of the greatest honors. Some songs are just classics. You don't touch classics. Yeah. And the only reason why we did that song is because Ronnie was involved and he produced it. Yeah. You know, from, he, the, he, from the background vocals to my vocal, everything. But he's a great, see, when you get a great singer, like I told you, when you get a signature singer, you, you know, you're going to argue. This, this, just like with David. David used to tell me, I said, well, man, you know, uh, I want you to do this right here. And then I said, but then do your own thing. He said, how you want it, man? <laughs> now, when a, when a guy like David Ruffin would tell me, he respects me. Same thing with Alex. He, I mean, we, we'll go, well, I don't want to do it exactly like that. I said, okay, man, but but I want that part like that, man. So it is, it's not me, it's your voice just doing it. I said, if you went to sing my girl, what would you do? I've got sunshine. Well, you're going to tell him, I ain't doing it like that. <laughs> but that's the song. <laughs> Rance Adam was the same way. Like that, I would tell Rance Adams, one of the greatest gospel singers. I don't know if you know of ever him. Ever to do it. You ever ever. heard of Rance? Have, have you guys ever heard of Rance Adams? 
I don't no. think so. I don't think I have. He, he, we're, he's one we're still learning. We're still learning. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, you check check Grand's out now. You know, he's one of the greatest uh, gospel singers, singers, period, that you can work with. And I, I was so amazed when I worked with him, but I just love working with singers because it just it gives me a chance to yeah. get my ideas and say, oh, man, this, if I could, if my if I had a voice like that, what would I do? You know, just like that, like painting a picture. You know, bringing things, bringing things uh, like up to date now with it, with your new music, and you've just mentioned then uh, the documentary of the Four Tops and MC Films as well. Um, mm. This is something I'm hearing a lot of recently. The documentary on the Four Tops that is now in the in the stages to be made, and that is so exciting because. I, this, I'm going off, like say, my research, you know, I, I've been into soul music, Motown for the last 10 years. But from my knowledge, I can't see that a documentary on the four tops but from the start up until present day. Has that ever been done before? And, no. and, and how are you going to include, how are you going to put all them years into one documentary? Uh, Alex mentioned the, mentioned, uh, the name Chris, uh, Chris Dixon. Uh, Chris Dixon and myself, uh, we met in Greece about 10, 12 years ago, and uh, I was uh, staying at a, 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 a town called Skiatos Town, and we uh, started bringing Motown acts to Skiatos. And we had an a outdoor arena that seats 11, uh, about 1,100 people. And I met Chris there, and Chris owned a disco in Skiatos. And so Chris and I, relationship started back in Greece and in that relationship uh, 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 over there Chris introduced me to a lot of folks in Athens and around the, in the different islands and so uh, Chris and I formed a company together together called MC Films uh, uh, a corporation to uh, go ahead and produce uh, this documentary on the four times. So that's how we heard the name Chris. I, I had to uh, go back and say, uh, say who Chris is. So it's Chris Nixon. Go ahead, Alex. Um, I just, I, no, what I was just saying was I just, the, the, the historian and the cornerstone of the documentary is Duke Fakir. Um, one thing, um, Duke, Duke's mind and his memory is sharper than a tack. And it's amazing. Um, I remember one time we were on the tour bus and uh, <laughs> Chief came from the back and came and sat up front with us. And he had a, like a four series iPhone. He had his regular phone, but he had like this old four series iPhone. But on this iPhone, he had every song that the tops have ever recorded. And he set up front with, uh, with us and we plugged him into the system and he set and songs that I've never heard before. And he began to play those songs and then begin to give us the backstories and the backdrops of every single one of those songs. You know, even to the point <laughs> he told us about how when they were living in New York and they had, they were living, all four of them were living in a one bedroom in a one bedroom studio and it had a pull out couch. And for this week, two would sleep up top, another two on the floor, and the next week they would switch. And how when they were getting ready to leave um, New York uh, to go to the another level of their career, uh, Levi drove his car up there, but they didn't have enough money to pay for the parking bill. Oh, wow. So they left Levi's car in New York. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But my thing is, you know, the, the sacrifices that they made, Yes. you know, for us to be here. And so to hear from the beginning to where things presently are and the future that we are, are believing to manifest, um, Duke is the cornerstone of that. And um, it, it's, uh, when I tell you the, the stories and the things that he's going to bring are going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. And one thing about him is uh, Duke cares about his people and the people that are connected with him. 
really, really love that, you know, Marlin and Chris have now got together and this documentary with Duke as well, like you've just said, Duke's memories and that he is still out there to this day with the four tops, one of the original, <coughs> original members, you know what I mean? That has been there, seen it, done it all. I've also been told that he has wrote a book as well. And mm -hmm. it is incredible mm -hmm. now that you are working on this documentary. Like we said, it's not been done before. Why not? This group is, you know, it's lasted forever. And the music is going to last forever. It's going to be passed on to new generations. We need to get this into a documentary now. And it's so exciting. I cannot wait. I think the reason why it hasn't happened, um, timing is everything. I think you can do the right thing at the wrong time and be wrong every time. Um, and I believe that some things are a God thing and I think some things are ordained to be at a certain time. Yeah. And I believe that the one thing about Duke is that he is very, he's very protective of the legacy of the tops. And he's very protective of anyone that is speaking on behalf of or representing or standing as a conduit for the tops. And until he felt that the right circumstance had come, it wasn't about money, it wasn't about this or that, it was about character, integrity, and the timing. And I, I just believe that uh, things came together at the time that they were ordained to. Do you, do you three have anything to say to the Northern Soul scene? And um, we can bring it back to them and just let them know that you, you know, what you're up to. And I don't know, just give, just give them something back a little bit. Northern Soul, you know, I love you because you, you bring me back over there time and time again. And I love coming over there. Okay. Y'all my favorite fan. Matter of fact, you know, I got more fans in the Northern Soul than I do in the States because I was pushed more over there than I was here. It was like, you know, it just happened accidentally, but I'm, I'm glad for it. I always felt connected to the Northern Soul viewers and, and record buyers to my great friend, Edward Starr, and also J.J. Barnes, and, and just still be J.J. Barnes. <laughs> yeah. My man. Right. And still be connected with this Northern Soul and this new project that we're doing that we're doing with uh, Ronnie and Alex. It's a great pleasure to be connected with that. That connects me back to the Northern Soul. So we love you all, the Northern Soul, and look out for our records. Thank you. I'm newly introduced to Northern Soul to some extent. Um, one of the good one of, one of your wonderful DJs, Hitsville Chalky. Oh yeah. Uh, the yeah. very first the very first interview I ever did after becoming a four top was with Hitsville Chalky. Great guy. And um you all embraced me and you gave me a chance. And to all of the Northern Souls, I want to say thank you. I appreciate you and I, I appreciate your support. And uh Ronnie and I, besides Isn't She a Pretty Girl, we're getting ready to work on something just for Northern Soul. Uh -huh. And so like a little uh, duets project with Ronnie and I uh, that's going to be all Northern Soul. I got one more thing to say about Chalky. What, what Chalky took, when I really got hip to the Northern Soul, I mean, sitting in my class was out there, but when I got with the Four Tops, I was able to travel all over the world. Okay, so when, when I was in, uh, we came over to the UK, the, it was some years ago, and Chalky, I hadn't met him before, and he walked up to me and said, look, man, he said, you're off tomorrow. He said, I'd love you to go somewhere with me. I said, go where, man? He said, you need it. And what he was taking me to was one of the things like the Blackpool, okay? I had did them back in the early, in the late 80s, but I hadn't been doing as much after I got with the Four Times. So when I, while I was over, he said, come on, please go. So I went, he said, you'll never regret it. So I went with him and I went to one of the, you know, like the, when they meet over the weekend and yes, everybody yeah. selling the records to, 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 to each other. And they announced me and I went up on the stage and people ran up on me like I was Michael Jackson or something. And I didn't, I, it, threw, it blew my mind. I said, man, he said, what is this all about? He said, I told you, man, that's why I wanted you to come here, man. I wanted you to see how, what kind of fans you've got that you don't even know about. And when I saw that, it just touched me. Man, me and Chalk been like this ever since. And Chalk has booked me 
but we still work together over there. Doing That's stuff. lovely, lovely. Uh, you know what? It's Phil Troke, big respect to him. Yeah. Love him to bits, great guy. And he's looked after me on the scene equally as well. And I uh, just a message to you guys, if you are ever in the, in the UK, over in England, and you are in our, where we are, do you know what I mean? We would love to meet up. We're everybody. gonna be over there in October for two weeks doing all the arena tours doing the arena oh, tour. Wow. So we better see you guys' faces. Definitely. Yes, we'll definitely. Definitely. There's, there's gonna be problems. <laughs> yeah, there'll be problems. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank, Thank you all for having us. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you for being part I'm, of the Soul Archive. I gotta tell you one more story. Hey, Marlon, check this out. So when I first went to, when I, when I first came to England, I was with Ike, Ike and Tina Turner. I played in their band. And I was over there, and so one of you, well, a girl, we were we were at the hotel, and the girl said, uh, "I forgot, I forgot me me hat," and I said, "What?" She said, "I forgot me hat." I said, "No, nah, Miss, you mean I forgot my hat?" She said, "No, no, no, I forgot me hat." So I kept, I, I mean, I got an argument with the lady. I said, "Look here, Miss." <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, you mean I forgot my hat. So one of the guys from Ice Band said, look here, uh, fool. Over here, me means my. I said, oh, okay, I didn't know that, you know. <laughs> so, so, is, is, that, is, that, is that like Cockney? We said, I forgot me hat. Oh, is that, that, that is, no. That, I that, think that's Wigan, maybe. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, that, yeah. Is, that is, Ronnie, you are doing the Wigan dialect, sir. I tell you what, just, okay. just just for the Wigan viewers, just for our Wigan, Wig, uh, our, you know, fellow Wiganers, <laughs> we'd love you to do a Wigan slang. So what should we say? Um, do you know, Ronnie? <laughs> do you know what? Babby's yet and P wet is. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I I I have to be I have to be a translator with okay. Chuck. Okay. Got to like that, you know. So, so a baby's yed and pee wet is a Wigan delicacy. <laughs> oh, okay. Right, okay. And it is, what it means is, so it's a steamed pie, right? Okay, so it's like a baby's head because it's a- uh, The way it's, it's cooped. It's, 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 a bit, it's a bit soft. And uh, pee wet is not peas, it's the pea juice. There you go. So next time, next time, next time you come over to England and you're around the Manchester area. Yeah, we'll 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 take you to a chicky in Blackpool. We're when coming you go to, to Manchester. Blackpool and, uh, <laughs> oh, we, we we're play, coming yeah. to Manchester. That's we play Manchester time. every. Yeah, that's always with us. Manchester, we played it all the way. I remember that's where we first seen yeah. you in uh, 2014. I think he was with uh, Frida Payne. Yeah, Frida as well. Payne. Yeah. Got some tough hombres in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Well, right. thank you so much for this opportunity. Once again, thank you for being part of the Soul Archive, the people's story. And I hope to be talking to you soon. All right. Thank you for having us.